Welcome everyone to 284 News. My name is Javon Wilson. I'm Kamal Hines. And I'm Ron Grant. And we are so thrilled and happy to be coming to you live out of the beautiful British Virgin Islands. The content continues via our website, 284media.com. In today's news, former Governor Augustus Jasper says calling the COI was one of the most difficult decisions made as governor. He says overwhelmingly serious allegations and concerns led to his decision. We also see the Auditor General Sonia Webster uh, being cornered by government's COI's attorney on her failure to publish the audit report, which was subsequently leaked. And we also see the Education Ministry to implement stricter anti-bullying measures across all schools in the BVI following reports of increase in bullying. And across the region, Governor General Sandra Mason to become Barbados' first president in food security and sustainability bill to update century-old legislation and will establish an agriculture and fisheries authority uh, to regulate the quality of produce. We have the details of these stories and so much more on today's edition of 284 News. You value traditions. To move in. You value music. You value education. Family. I love you. <laughs> Service. Thank you. You're welcome. Love. Life. At Popular, we're committed to you and everything our community values. For the things you value the most, Count on us. Popular. A pleasant good evening and welcome, viewers. It is Thursday, October 21st, 2021. My name is Javon Wilson. And I'm Kamal Haynes, coming to you live from the beautiful British Virgin Islands. And I just want to officially wish my colleague Javon Wilson a very happy, happy birthday. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You, Kamal. Well, we start with news. Um, from the COI, where former governor of the British Virgin Islands, Augustus Jasper, has said that calling the Commission of Inquiry was one of the most difficult decisions he made during his tenure as governor, but one that had to be made following alarming concerns raised by many individuals. Well, Jasper made those comments when he appeared before the COI on Wednesday, October 20th, where he explained why he decided to call the inquiry. It should be very clear that as governor, one of my most difficult decisions was to call the Commission of Inquiry. It's not a step I would have ever wanted to have do uh, or undertake, uh, have done rather, or undertake, should there have been any other way to, to avoid um, doing so. Um, with those specific ones that you mentioned, there was still um, investigations underway at that uh, point. But for me, calling the Commission of Inquiry was really because of the cumulative concerns that were presented to me about uh, good governance, which covered not just specific um, reports that you've mentioned, although those, some of those themes, I saw the practice continuing. So the practice... Well, the, the former governor also lined some of the major concerns raised to him, which included allegations of persons, he said, that hold pivotal positions in the BVI society that are actively involved in the cocaine drug trafficking organized crime. Well, for example, tender waivers conti continuing, the practice of, um, for example, employing consultants without competition, the practice of not um, uh, allegedly not complying with the laws of the territory. Um, also, some of the practices of appointing people to, to boards, statutory boards, with little transparency or openness in uh, the process. Uh, or sometimes that uh, there was uh, some of the institutions hindered in carrying out their work to look at some of um, alleged uh, areas um, which may need to be looked at in more uh, detail. So at that point, uh, when I believe in, we had discussed and looked at, at the, those issues, um, the concerns were, uh, were presented to me uh, uh, later relating to a cumulative set of concerns, um, as I've outlined, um, including more, more widely um, concerns that had been um, rel relayed to me, um, many allegations, including from uh, a, a credible public officers, uh, leaders of some of our institutions, as well as credible members of the public. Um, of serious concerns relating to intimidation of public officers, serious concerns uh, relating to allegations of decisions being directed outside of processes. Um, and 
Most concerning is uh, also allegations of links to organized criminality and to um, those involved in the cocaine trafficking uh, trade uh, as well, including allegedly um, at, uh, uh, amongst those in the highest uh, holders of office. Well, viewers, Jasper believes his decision to call the COI is for the good of the territory, as it will help to strengthen good governance in the BVI and improve some of the many discrepancies found during the investigation process. Uh, well, Javon, um, I know many would have questioned why the former governor would have initially um, decided to call the inquiry at the end of his term um, as governor of the territory. But here he's saying, you know, obviously the alarming um, many concerns that was raised by many persons to him would have basically sparked his decision to um, basically make that very, as he said, very, very tough decision to call the COI. Absolutely, and he did list uh, some legitimate concerns, and, but again, the timing came into question. Uh, but also how things were done, I do recall as well, once the uh, COI was launched, uh, that you know the information had uh, initially reached the international media even prior to us having access to certain critical information here in the territory. So all of that brought into question uh, the possible agenda behind this COI, but uh, I think it is... Um, safe for us to say that there is a lot of pros and cons coming out of the COI and a lot of persons are more so leaning towards the pros. Uh, just this very question was asked uh, at the Miss British Virgin Islands pageant just recently. What is the COI and how will it affect the BVI? And I'm very happy to know that uh, quite a number of the uh, young ladies were very uh, fay and really uh, knowledgeable on what it is because it is a very critical process that will penetrate some way, in some way or the other the fabric and the future of the Virgin Islands. So we, we really have to continue to, to see how this unravels. Now, viewers, as we move on, the Auditor General, former Auditor General, that is, Ms. Sonia Webster, was placed on the hot seat regarding the Neighborhood Partnership Project audit by Sir Jeffrey Cox, QC, who is representing the Attorney General in the ongoing COI. The project, which was done under the then-VIP administration to the tune of some $571,800 was met with major controversy at, uh, uh, after sorry, it was alleged that little to no deliverables were uh, provided upon completion of the contract. Now, the Virgin Islands Neighborhood Partnership Project, VINPP, designed and introduced by the former Education Minister, Honorable Andrew Foy, back in 2008, yielded virtually no results, despite his ministry paying more than half of a million dollars in fees to consultancy firm Claude Otley Consulting Limited over the course of several months. Now, that was the conclusion of the official report that was leaked to local media after years of being withheld from the public. The report also cited a number of, I quote, questionable, end of quote, expenses paid under the project. Now, viewers, Sir Jeffrey Cox, during Wednesday's COI session, highlighted that the Auditor General, Ms. Sonia Webster, failed to publish the report on the Auditor General's website, the office's website, nor was that document presented to the House of Assembly or in any cabinet paper. However, evidence shows that the audited report was leaked both in 2011 as well as 2019. Some persons allege that it was in an attempt to sway the elections. Now, viewers, Mrs. Webster, the website, said the website manager left the territory and used that as the reasoning behind why the office when it was unable to publish the document, but further highlighted that it was published earlier this year for the very first time. Mrs. Webster said, and I quote, it had not been issued by the ministry officially, and it had not been published by me, end of quote. However, viewers, this was strongly rebuffed by Sir Jeffrey Cox, who said, and I quote, you had, Ms. Webster, some scathing things to say about this project. You mentioned that the program was so blatantly false, so blatantly wrong. You said we couldn't sit on it. We can't just leave it on the side of our desks. And you pointed out various other matters that concerned you about it. And my question to you is, given that importance, did you ever inquire why the minister or the ministry uh, on why they had not tabled it or was, um, was their legal obligation to do so? In response, Ms. Webster said, and I quote, Sir, my job is to do the audit, complete the report, 
pass it on to the ministry, and then their job commences there. It is their job to take the report forward, and I am not going to take any responsibility for the fact that they did not take the report forward, end of quote. Now, viewers, Sir Jeffrey Cox further asked her if she inquired from the Ministry of Education's permanent secretary, Dr. Marcia Potter, if she intended to put the report forward or use it internally. Mrs. Webster responded, and I quote, the permanent secretary knows what to do with an audit report, sir. She went on to say, um, sorry, Mr. Cox went on to say, why didn't you take uh, steps to publish or draw to the public's attention? In 2012, 2013, 14, 2019, she replied that they had it up on their website um, and then she said they were also engaged with other audits. Now, viewers, a seemingly irritated Auditor General replied, I am not sitting in my office wondering what's happening with the MPP report. I am not. I have other things to do. In response, Cox said, but this is a very controversial report, was it not? She replied, all of them are very controversial, and I am not seeing why you're so focused on this one, because they're all very controversial. Mr. Cox then insisted on the reason why the report was only published on our website this year, and Mrs. Webster concluded by saying, I did not have the means to publish it at that time. We have a website now, and that report, along with others, have been put to the website. Now, Kamal, I know this particular project, uh, the Neighborhood uh, Partnership Project, was brought into question as one of the consulted contracts, um, which is it is alleged that uh, brought forward little to no deliverables under the then VIP administration. And of course, the COI is looking into uh, possible corruption, so I can imagine that indeed this would have come up. However, we see uh, the Attorney General's lawyer, Sir Jeffrey Cox, really going for uh, Mrs. Webster and almost like holding her accountable for whatever role she also had to play in bringing this report to the public. Indeed, and he was just basically questioning um, if, uh, as the, um, as she was basically stating the need for it to be public, he was basically questioning why didn't you make it public over these years and she's justifying as to why, um, you know, she probably didn't take the, the, the um, ultimate decision to then make it public then, but obviously as she said, she then uh, went ahead and made it public this year when the website was up and running and made available. Yes, and you know, one of the things again, we, as we double back to the COI and we speak about, you know, how things are unraveling again, I think what's it's, what it's identifying is some of the loopholes that we really have to fix. One of the issues we've faced through successive governments is the inability of you know, the Auditor General's office to publish these reports. So I'm really happy that, that they are coming to the forefront and that, you know, taxpayers, the members of the BVI populace can hold legislators and all persons in public office accountable for these projects. And as you said, that's one of the many benefits of this COI actually shows some of the constraints and some of the difficulties even she as the Auditor General would have faced in trying to get some of these audits conducted, whether it be, um, you know, um, some hiccups from the Premier's office or other ministries or permanent secretaries. We, if not for the COI, would have not have been made aware of these difficulties mm -hmm. that experienced with these um, very important institutions which are made to basically uphold good governance in the territory. Yes. Well, viewers, well, up next, Education Ministry to implement stricter anti-bullying measures across all schools in the BVI following reports of increase in bullying. And we also see in Barbados Governor General Sandra Mason to become Barbados' first president. We hear these stories after a word from our sponsors. Welcome back viewers. 
where the Ministry of Education will be implementing even stricter anti-bullying measures across all schools in the British Virgin Islands following reports which suggest an increase in bullying in local schools. Well, Acting Chief Education Officer Connie George made that disclosure during the opening ceremony of the Anti-Bullying Week, which commenced on Sunday, October 17th. Well, CEO George said that despite the presence of bullying being in almost all aspects of today's society, it will not be tolerated in schools across the territory. As we begin Anti-Bullying Week, I take this opportunity to speak out against bullying and our zero tolerance to acts of destructive behaviors. We will be running an anti-bullying campaign in all schools in the territory for this upcoming week. The theme is one kind word. Bullying is real and it comes in different forms and at different magnitudes of expression. But it is all bad and will erode and destroy a person. There are many issues in the news that involve bullying and the bad things that happen. People are affected from being bullied. Bullying is happening everywhere and the chances that you will encounter it is high. There seem to be an increase in the number of reports of cases of bullying in recent weeks. But I send a loud message today that no form of bullying will be tolerated in schools. Outside of the usual measures, we are prepared to implement additional corrective measures to bring bullying under control and eminently eradicate it. Well, the education boss also pointed to empirical data which shows the very harsh reality of the effects bullying can have among children. Well, she listed five main consequences of bullying which have been observed not only internationally but also domestically in the territory. Research shows, one, children who were frequently bullied by their peers were more likely to develop psychotic symptoms in their early adolescence. Two, Girls were much more likely than boys to be victims of both cyber and traditional bullying. Three, young people who bully have a one in four chance of having a criminal record by the age of 30. Four, bullying is the fourth most common reason young people suffer from mental health issues. And five, Extreme bullying, often using sexual slurs, is becoming a common experience for students of all ages, and in particular for children aged 11 to 13. Now, with all schools sending messages against bullying this week and making it a part of the culture in schools every day, enforcing the use of kind words and positive behaviors, we will see the change we need. I encourage the community to join us this week in support of anti-bullying. Bullying will stop and must stop. What well, a theme for this year's Anti-Bullying Week is one kind word. And the Minister of Education, Dr. Natalia Wheatley, said that positive-minded words can go a long way in combating bullying across the territory. One kind word may well be all that is needed to initiate change. Kind words have the capacity to shift our focus to things that are more positive and open a door to healing and growth. A kind word expresses care and it encourages. Proverbs 15.4 reminds us that gentle words bring life and health. The use of kind words is something that as a community we can all practice. As a response strategy to bullying, it is brilliant. It allows all to engage in a practice that reduces the bullying of children and young people. Currently, some in our society seem bent on doing the opposite. We hear unkind words that cut down on social media posts and in comments on news sites in popular music played around the community, in television programs, even TikTok. This week we must resist this trend by deciding instead to use kind words. It is a small step, 
but one that as a community, if we adopt, will help to reduce the incidences of bullying. I challenge all of us to walk against bullying by speaking kind words. Well, viewers, the education minister said it is a small step, but one if adopted by the community will assist in reducing incidences of bullying in the BVI. Well, Javon, we do know that bullying is a very um, prominent um, incident or a prominent action in today's society. Uh, we see a lot, um, not only physically, but also we see a lot of cyberbullying. And as um, the, the um, acting CEO, Chief, Chief Executive Officer, sorry, Chief Ed Education Officer said that this um, bullying does have consequences and, and, and we do see a lot of persons retaliating after suffering um, years and years of bullying. And, and, and we find that sometimes, even as children, um, what they do is they, they tend to bottle in this bullying, sometimes they don't go back home to their parents and inform them of what is taking place. And what it does is it creates some form of anger inside some children mm -hmm. who then um, obviously unleash it um, as they get older and in different forms, basically some unleash it back to their families at home, to their siblings, etc. But we do see that bullying overall is not a good thing and it, nothing, good's come, nothing good comes out of bullying. Absolutely. And I'm really happy to see us raising awareness and really building a campaign around this because it really starts at that level with the children. Like you said, Kamal, a lot of kids internalize uh, these type of acts and, you know, they act out in places across the world. I mean, fortunately, we have not seen this type of behavior within the school system here. But uh, overseas, you know, you see kids coming back to school with, with, uh, with guns or, or some form of um, weapon yeah. to retaliate. So we really want to uh, be able to arrest this issue at such a tender age, especially. So I'm really happy to see the ministry really prioritizing uh, curbing this particular issue. Now, viewers, as we move on, a look across the region. Barbados legislators Wednesday elected 72-year-old Governor General Dam Sandra Prunella Mason to be the first ever president as the island moves to end its political relationship with Britain and adopt a Republican status that is going to be happening on November 30th. It's Independence Day. Now, viewers, all but one of the legislators who were present during the joint sitting of the two houses of parliament voted in support of Dam Sandra, who had been nominated by both Prime Minister Mia Motley and the opposition leader, Bishop Joseph Atheley, to replace Queen Elizabeth II as Barbados' head of state. Now, the opposition senator, Mr. Caswell Franklin, earlier walked out in the joint sitting of Parliament held, held sorry, at the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center after objecting to her nomination. His walkout came after the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Arthur Hodge, read a letter from the Prime Minister, Mia Motley, advising of the joint nomination. Now, both Houses of Parliament viewers subsequently split to meet in separate rooms to cast secret ballots on the matter. However, when voting began in the Senate, Franklin raised yet another objection, this time about the ballots. Mr. Franklin said, and I quote, This document has no validity. It comes from nowhere, he said. He continued, I have deemed it to be, I'm sorry, the Senate President, Mr. Reginald Farley, responded, I have deemed it to be valid. You cannot deem something to be valid that has no constitutional or legislative basis, Sir Franklin said, adding, you will not treat me this way. I will not stand for it. You will have to put me out, end of quote. Now, viewers, the opposition leader insisted that he be heard, and when the Senate president said his concern had been noted, Franklin said that his concern had not been addressed, repeating his position, and I quote, this document has no validity. It comes from nowhere. Now, viewers, the continued, someone made this up last night after I told people to get things in place because I'm going to object. So you rush and you do this. I did not want to surprise anybody. I told everybody that this was going to happen to show you that the nonsense that we did in the House and the Senate last time when we passed the Constitution Amendment Act, there are no rules, he added. Now, viewers, the Senate president reminded legislators that the parliament makes its own rules for voting. Had there been no objection, Dam Sandra would have been declared the duly elected first president of, the, uh, of Barbados as dictated by section, section 14 sorry, of the Constitution. Dam Sandra was born on January 17, 1949 in uh, East Point, St. Philip, and was educated at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus in Barbados. 
and the Hugh Wooding Law School in Trinidad, graduating with a Bachelor's of Law degree in 1973 and a certificate uh, in legal education in 1975. She became the first Barbadian female attorney to have graduated from the Hugh Wooding Law School. And in 1998, she completed a course in judicial administration at Ripa, London, and a course in alternative dispute resolution at the University of Windsor, Canada, in Sitfield, Hendy, Houston in 2000. Now, so many accolades we can go over for Mrs. Mason. Uh, uh, come on, I know this is your home country. Uh, how are you feeling about Barbados becoming a republic on November 30th? Well, for me, um, my, my opinions really don't really count, but I, what I can say is, um, based off the feedback I would have gotten from the society, there is a mix, you know, where persons, there are some persons who, who really want it to happen, where others are stating, um, well, we weren't consulted as, as, a, as a democratic society um, for this decision. Further, furthermore, we don't have a decision on who becomes president, one, and two, we don't have a decision on if we really want to become a republic. Mm -hmm. That should have been a decision mm -hmm. that should have, should have been brought to the people of the, of the island. And a lot, a lot of persons actually feel that way. They're feeling as though, um, yes, there is, is the, the, the Barbados Labour Party that's presently in power, um, obviously, by um, um, Her Excellency uh, Mia Moore Motley. But a lot of persons feel that, you know, they, they don't have any say, you know, obviously last election she would have won all these seats by a landslide, uh, which would have been history in Barbados. But which essentially says that there is no, not, a, not an opposition presence. Does well, it, initially it? there was not an opposition presence, but one of her, um, per, uh, one of her ministers or one of her constituents um, would have obviously walked off, okay. uh, would have left the party and we've gone into his own party basically and then created his own opposition basically from that. So initially there was no opposition of another party. Um, and which some persons think is a threat to democracy. Exactly. And uh, what persons are saying now, um, now we are seeing the disadvantages of, you know, a clear landslide victory in terms of what it has, um, in terms of a, a, a Westminster form of government where mm -hmm. you have an overwhelming power in terms of decision making because obviously she, she has the majority um, and in the, um, in the Senate in terms of um, the lower house uh, with the ministers and stuff. And then obviously when it comes to the upper house, uh, upper, upper Senate, obviously she would obviously have the overall majority when it comes to voting for any policy, any law. Um, so a, a lot of persons are actually seeing the consequences of this. And, and it, to me, for me personally, I would say it threatens democracy. Um, and a lot of persons are, are basically um, with that same viewpoint, you know, mm -hmm. regarding having the decision when it comes to critical things like this because what a republic does, um, it obviously changes the entire landscape of, of, Bar of Barbados' um, mm -hmm. constitution um, and, and the overall um, outlook on how Barbados will be governed going forward. So it's not just a, a small step or a small little uh, walkover, it's a, it's a real major step and some persons feel as though more um, they should have had more say in such yeah. a decision. Yeah. But what the other persons are arguing is that this is something that was supposed to be done years ago, decades ago, and it's something that was long overdue and is something that, you know, if people just keep talking about it, nothing will be done. So there are both sides of the story here, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, um, I guess by November 30th, we Barbados shall will be a republic. Will be a republic. And come on, I'm really happy that we're able to cover regional stories, in particular this topic because even in the BVI we, we often uh, consider the conversation of independence and the walk to independence uh, and so we really have to examine what's going on within the region and even within the BVI uh, many persons when they hear independence you know automatically say you know this is not something that we're ready for uh, but really it is Ha it has to be in consultation with the people. A referendum needs to be had. The people have to, you know, play a, a, a efficient role in that process. So I'm really happy uh, that we can continue to carry stories like this because, again, it speaks to the importance of the people who really elect these uh, politicians, these legislators to lead over the people. Indeed, and we do see, um, obviously, um, there's always a talk about self-determination um, in many countries, as you said, in the BVI, that's the talk right now. But um, as, you know, the former um, legislators in these places, such as Barbados in 1966, you know, if persons like Arabara didn't decide that they would actually take that step, you know, probably would have been still talking about, you know, independence. Right. So yes. it it's about taking the step and not just about talking it. And I guess that's what Mayor Moore Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, is presently doing to advance Barbados into the next phase of self-determination and independence. 
All right, viewers, I think that is all the time we have for today, but I want to encourage you to check out our website, 284media.com. We're also on Facebook at 284media and, and Instagram as well as Twitter at 284BVI. My name is Javon Wilson. And I'm Kamal Haynes. Viewers, have a happy Thursday.